Hi and welcome to the full interview about the Volvo S80 with Peter Horbury. Peter's had an amazing career. He headed up design at Volvo in the 1990s, which we'll spend most of our time talking about. He then moved on to head up design at the PAG Group, the premier automotive group, uh, Ford's group, that comprised Jaguar, Land Rover, Aston Martin, and Volvo. From there, he moved to Detroit to head up Ford's design there, and he's now helping Lotus with their next generation of cars. Lotus is owned by Geely, that also owns Volvo, so it's a coming home of sorts. So as you can imagine, it was wonderful to ask Peter key questions about the development of both generations of the S80, the Ford acquisition and the Geely takeover 10 years later. So without further ado, here's the full interview. Welcome, Peter. Thank you for taking part in this interview. It's it's wonderful to hear the perspectives of, of people that have actually lived and breathed these cars and breathed life into them. So, of course, before the Volvo S80 came this concept car in the early 1990s called the ECC or Environmental Concept Car. So what were the goals around the new design language that embodied the ECC? Well, to be honest, the, uh, the, the, the idea was, uh, it came from our, what we call the Volvo Monitoring and Concept Center in California. And they were working on a technology to create a hybrid um, vehicle. The idea being, and this is way back in 1991, that you could drive um, in, say we're in Los Angeles, you could drive in the city without any emissions whatsoever because you're using the battery. But then you could drive from Los Angeles to San Francisco uh, using the, 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 the powertrain, which in, in fact, in that car, it was a gas turbine. It could have been a diesel for all we know. But um, then when you got to San Francisco, you'd have enough electricity created or generated so that when you got to the city, you could drive through the city emission free. So that was the idea that we were working on uh, way back in 1991. And I have to say, if, if, you know, if we'd sort of maintained that uh, momentum with the project, hybrids would have been a Volvo mainstay uh, much earlier than anybody else. However, um, one of the things was that the, the intention was just to kit out an 850, a Volvo 850, which had just been launched in 91. Uh, and I just joined Volvo in 91, so it all came together at the same time. Um, but they, that we would just put the powertrain, this idea, into a Volvo 850. But I thought the opportunity was too great to miss that we could show something totally new in design and, and put the, this new revolutionary powertrain into, well, a revolutionary shape. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, wonderful. I mean, it's it's a great thing to do. So obviously, Volvo had a very boxy look at that time. I mean, there were there were jokes about it, and um, was there a, was was Volvo keen to get away from the boxy design? I was. <laughs> <laughs> um, it it the, what what really happened was that. Here was an opportunity to show something different as a design language for Volvo because it was a one-off. This was a concept car, and it wasn't going to make or break the company. And uh, I, I flew out on my first visit to this Volvo Monitoring and Concept Center. I went with the senior management, and um, it was there that I, I looked at some sketches on the wall, and there was one sketch which I just knew immediately this is it. And I persuaded my colleagues in the, in the management that we should do something with this powertrain concept, which also uh, showcased something new for Volvo. And as I said, it wasn't going to make or break the company, but it was a worthwhile experiment. And the sketch was from Doug Frazier, um, who was a designer in the um, California studio then. And uh, I saw it immediately that he, he got this flush front with the, the, the grill up front. And 
the shoulders, the, the, the flat topped fenders and shoulders and the V-shaped bonnet, and I saw immediately the PV544. But not just any PV544, it was the rally versions or the race versions where they took the bumpers off and the, the grill low down was up front. And it, I just saw it immediately in this sketch and I thought, well, we've got to make this. And uh, that was the start of it. Ah, yes. And of course, referencing those old Volvo, Volvo cars, of course, these were all designed by Jans Vilsgaard, who had been such a force of nature in Volvo for so long. And then, of course, Jan retires in, I think, the, presumably the, the end of the 80s. Was there a big shadow looming over you with sort of the, the with Jan Vilsgaard's design and you feel that you have to follow that or were Volvo very happy to give you free reign and allow you to just go for it? Well, the, the, there was a mixture of people in the senior management at the time. There were, let's say, older and younger. And uh, I did have a, a hard time in some cases to persuade them that it was time to move on. Um, but you see, the, the, the boxy Volvos were not there forever because Jan Vilsko designed the Amazon, which was anything but boxy. And uh, I, I, I used that as a, as a reason. The, the PV544, which was quite an old design based on a Ford in the 40s, um, but it had a lot of certain shapes, which I eventually persuaded everybody that they were truly Scandinavian. And then with the, the Amazon and all its curves and roundedness and the, the pointed front, it was a way I could persuade them that we could look at the heritage beyond the 850, beyond the 760, and go back and, and recreate something which uh, had a lot more shape, a lot more form. But um, I was also able to show them that we were true to the Volvo principles of um, the, the arc of the shoulders running uh, down all the way from the front to the back, and then what we call the Volvo bridge, which was the three side windows with a dog leg at the back and uh, the, the surface running either side of that, where on the, on the 760 and the 960, they'd all been in one plane. I just moved them across to recreate that V shape of the Amazon and the trunk tucking in. But if you look directly from the side, you can see that, um, that Volvo look that was, to be honest, straight from the 960 and the 850, but given a more three-dimensional appearance. Forever the salesman, Peter, basically <laughs> pitching it as, <laughs> look, look, this is just a continuation. It's just, of what we've it's just like a 960. <laughs> <laughs> so another big thing about the ECC was it was a hybrid car. It was yeah. also a gas turbine car. And how, risk, how realistic was that? Um, was this just, um, there was all this talk about uh, California emissions regulations, and that's something that the ECC was pitched as, something yes. that essentially would allow Volvo to continue to sell cars in California, for example. How realistic did you think that you would be able to get this technology ready by 2000? Well, well, the beauty of the gas turbine was it, it runs at a constant revolution. It, it's not, you know, revving up and down like a petrol engine does. It just stays constant, the most efficient um, RPM, and it only generates electricity. Uh, the electricity drives the wheels regardless if it's coming directly from the gas turbine engine or from a stored or stored in a battery. So it did seem to be a very efficient way of uh, the use of fuel. So it, it um, but I think it, it perhaps was a little too complex at the time. And, uh, you know, there wasn't a readily available gas turbine you know, engine being built. But uh, it, as we've seen in, in you know, recent decade or recent years and decades, that the, the, the petrol engine or the diesel engine has has powered a hybrid drivetrain uh, for some years now, um, maybe going out of fashion you know, for the pure electric to take over. 
but um, it was certainly at the time a very new way of, uh, of looking at lowering the emissions. And, and don't forget, it was really the cities, Los Angeles especially, where the smog and the emissions were a real, real problem. And this was, uh, as I mentioned, a car that we could drive emission free in the city and then go somewhere at a distance um, relatively efficiently, but then get to that place and drive again emission free. So I think everything was was right. Um, we just didn't follow it up quite so quickly as we perhaps should have done. Mm. Okay, so okay, so the ECC's launched and people are very excited about it. So then comes the development for the first version of the S80. So yeah. can you tell us a little bit about the development process for that car? What were the main hurdles that you had? Well, we don't forget, in, in, at that time, we were in bed with Renault. And uh, that was uh, on the verge of being sealed a sealed deal. And we were actually working on a new car based on the Safran platform. Um, and then one day it all fell apart and the deal was off. So we had to, first of all, we had to facelift the old 960 and um, to, to, as a stopgap while we found another platform to work on. So we developed the P2, which was moving, it was based on the 850 platform, but moved on somewhat. And um, so then we had a couple of years that we had to fill the gap with a facelift 960 and, uh, and 850 and, um, and, and develop something totally new ourselves. But it, as I said, it was, a, it was um, a step on beyond the 850. But it gave us um, a lot of opportunity because the, the engines, we had a straight six, it was going to be a fairly upmarket car, but we turned the straight six around nine, you know, through 90 degrees. And that gave us the opportunity of bringing the screen forward. And, and I'm a, I've been a big believer in this cockpit forward or cab forward look ever since Chrysler started it, even if that was a windscreen forward and the people stayed further back, creating the biggest instrument panels or dashboards in the world. It, it had a look which, uh, to me, was as exciting as a mid-engine Ferrari 250 LM, you know, uh, and, and all the show cars that came after it. It, it created a, a new look, which I was a big fan of. And <clears throat> I've just been just we've just launched the new Lotus Electra, which follows that philosophy, you know, all the way. And that was uh, that was going to give us a, a, a really nice balanced proportion where the cabin uh, was sort of set between the wheels and not slung over the rear axle quite so much as the some of the competition. Whether that was the right thing at the time, because BMW was very popular, Audi had moved forward with front wheel drive, um, but BMW and Mercedes stayed true to the, you know, the powertrain at the front, like a horse-drawn vehicle, let's say. The, the horse at the front, the driver behind it, and the passenger sitting over the back axle of the carriage. It, it was a layout which was very familiar, but I was quite keen to move it uh, to this new look, which I felt has, had, you know, the, that was the way forward. So that was um, the, the, the powertrain, setting the powertrain across the car, uh, which needed a, a new newly invented manual gearbox, by the way, to uh, to manage that. And um, so from then on, from the S80, S60, V70, and the XC90, we had that more windscreen forward, cab forward, and it created a lot more room inside because of it. Now, with electric power, you get all of that free, but, you know, to, to package a six-cylinder engine uh, in that way was... Um, was the opportunity to create a new design language, uh, a new proportion. The shapes and forms were uh, added on top of that. Yeah. Um, and one thing I, I saw about 
the ECC and the first version of the SAT is that they're very similar looking cars in some respects, but the drag factor of both is completely different. So the ECC is 0.23, the uh, first version of the S80 was 0.28. And that always happens between concept cars and reality. What are what are the factors that mean that you, you can't get that same drag factor with a production car? Well, in this case, I, uh, it's, it's a long time ago, you know, Andy. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I think the, the, because Volvo had such um, set rules on ingress, egress, on uh, rear seat comfort, and don't forget the, the Swedish Swedish population is quite a tall race, and that rear seat comfort, that rear seat occupancy, was uh, very important. Not just the leg room, so the seats aren't quite far apart, but the headroom as well and getting in and getting out. So where the ECC had a, a lot faster line through the roof and then the tail, um, we, we had to compromise to get tall Swedes in and out and sitting comfortably in the back seat. Mm, okay, fair enough, that makes sense. Um, another thing is, is that Volvo at this time is trying to move up market. And the S80 is this flagship of luxury. Um, was the intention to really move up market and to try and beat Mercedes with this car? So, for example, Audi at this point, Audi in the 80s had really moved up market and turned themselves into almost a, a different kind of car company. And with such a fancy interior that the S80 had, were you realistically expecting to beat companies like Mercedes with the S80? I think up to a point, but going back to that time uh, and, and before that, Volvo in Sweden had been more or less the people's car, the Folkbil, as they say in Sweden. And it seemed to me that many people at Volvo felt there was a duty to supply the, the you know, Mr. and Mrs. Svensson's family car. So getting uh, getting the company to move up market would, would then abandon that um, duty, let's call it. So there was some resistance to how far up market you could go. And it was a, an interesting period um, where, you know, the, 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 the need to supply the Swedish market was um, was very much very very important at the time. Um, even if Volvo was famous for its exports to America and the UK and you know, all over the world, but to the Swedish market was very important, and um, it did, I think, hold us back a little bit in our quest to move into Mercedes territory because there always had to be the 2.3 base model, um, which would satisfy the local market. So Volvo was essentially torn at that point. And at I think since then, and it's taken a long time, but they've moved step by step into that, that position where I think today's uh, XC90 or the, the EX90, let's say, is well, price-wise it's there, and quality-wise, I think it's been there for quite a while, to be honest. Yeah. It, you know, and, and this has always been a problem that it, the, the, to be seen as premium, the, the, in China they, they call it ABB. It's Audi, Benz, BMW. And to get into that ABB, it would be you know, VABB. <laughs> um, but it, it's the, the cars are equal if not better, to be honest. I mean, some of the, the top line X, the EX90, XC90, V90, um, they are superb quality and content, but it's always, you know, that one step beneath the ABB group, but in reality, it's not. Um, it's just perception. I still read, when I read a road test or an article about a new Volvo. You know, Volvo known for their 
antique dealer, boxy uh, cars. That was 30, 40 years ago now. Uh, and it's frustrating for everybody that uh, it, it was such a, such a strong identity. And um, it's taken a long time to ditch it. Yeah, I think you're right. I I was very surprised when I first looked at the XC70 in the early 2000s when I was looking to buy a car. And I got in one and it's like, this is a really high quality car, but it's cheaper than those German rivals. And I'm always looking for a good deal. And, <laughs> and so, and I thought, this is just the, yeah. I mean, so for me, it was just the perfect thing. And um, yeah, so that's the reason why I had an XC70 and an XC90, because I thought they were fantastic. Yeah. Yes. And um, as I said, today, I think Volvo are definitely with their product on a par with the best. Um, whether people understand that or believe it, uh, that's another thing. Changing the perception of a brand is not an overnight um, yeah. phenomenon. So the S80 Mark I is launched. Um, fairly, certainly very successful at the start. Sales do start to, to, to drop off a little bit, unfortunately. But then, um, of course, we have the, the Ford acquisition and you start looking at the development of the Mark II S80. And I know at this point, that you've reached the stratospheric levels of being head of PAG design. But what can you tell me about the development process from this 10,000 foot view? Well, um, Ford had their ideas that they, they were very good at using um, the same platform over a number of vehicles. In fact, I'm not sure if you know, if you're aware, but the P2 that uh, was underneath that uh, S80, the original S80, went on to be the underpinnings of many Ford vehicles in America. It started off with the, the 500 and uh, the accompanying crossover, but then the, um, the next Explorer, the Flex, the Lincoln MKS, the, Link, the Lincoln MKR, all, all were based on, on that original P2 Volvo platform. So it did get its, um, get its moment of glory. But then the next S80 was to be based on the EUCD platform, Ford platform, which would make the Mondeo and a couple of other vehicles um, in some of the other brands. But the EUCD was a lot narrower. Uh, it had a completely different proportion. Um, but it was a, a very forward way of doing things to get to the most out of, out of one of their new platforms. Mm. OK. Um, yeah. Yeah, and certainly uh, a very successful I mean, essentially, that's what Volvo were doing themselves. They were reusing platforms as much as they could, and that was the, mm. the, the direction to go. Well, the, the S80 begat the S60, the V70, and the XC90. But one of the issues there was that it's much easier to start with the the, the lower car, the, the smaller car, let's say, or the, cheaper, the less expensive car, and then add on to it to create the most or the most expensive. What we did, we started off with the S80, the top of the line, and then we had to try and reduce that to make a cheaper S60 uh, V70. So that was a little bit of an issue at the time. Mm. So. What were Ford's goals around the SAT uh, second generation car and how did these differ from Volvo's own uh, goals for the first generation car? Um, the, the, well, the, the goals weren't that different. Uh, it's just that it was perhaps a more limiting platform. Remember, it's a Mondeo and to create you know, Mercedes competitor, then, you know, you have to work hard to do that. And you know, by then, of course, the, the overhangs, the front overhang was quite long. Um, and, uh, you know, other dimensions were, were, as I said, the width 
a certain, you have to have a certain heft in a car to create that upmarket uh, appearance. And when you're following the second generation S, S80, you'll see it's quite slim, let's say. So it sounds like you're more compromised in what you could do with the S80 second generation than, than you were with your first one because you had you were having to react to what Ford was giving you. Yeah, and and, and Ford are you know, great at making money, and, and um, you know that that uh, was the, the, direct, the, the directive that we should use this platform. Um, but it was always going to be you know, an issue to create a luxury or anywhere near a luxury car that was that much smaller in, in width. And uh, I think it was a very nice, very competent design, but it, it, by then the BMW had set the scene with zero front overhang, the, the front wheel way beyond the, the, shut, you know, the front door shot line or dash to axle as we called it. Um, and that was the very popular uh, format for cars. The, uh, even Audi had a problem with um, the length of their front overhangs uh, around the same time. It, it was never seen to be truly a Mercedes BMW competitor. Okay. So were Ford uh, happy with the progress of Volvo sales in the 2000s? <laughs> Never. <laughs> no, <maybe. laughs> um, it's. I can't criticize. It was a great company to work for. I went on to become head of design in Detroit, but um, the view from Detroit is, you know, that there's a, a long, a big distance of the Atlantic Ocean, and uh, Detroit doesn't necessarily translate into Europe quite so easily as perhaps um, the Ford thought, but it, it's not limited to Ford. I, I worked for Chrysler in the 1970s in Coventry. And, you know, the Hillman Avenger was an American design, the Chrysler 182 litre was an American design. And you remember Vauxhalls at the time were all very American influenced. And, uh, you know, I always felt that Companies like Opel, for example, were, were the only German car company pretending not to be, as it were, <laughs> which yeah. is a great waste of an opportunity, of course. Um, yeah. But you know, the, this um, the, the Ford, GM, Chrysler disappeared. But um, that 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 sort of way of thinking that we all want to drive American cars, I think wasted an opportunity for the um, for the companies when they did european cars they did them very very well i mean look at the success of the fiesta and um, focus and all the escorts since then but when it came to bigger cars and um, opel capitan and uh, ford zodiac <laughs> the mark for zodiacs for example they were pure american yeah yeah, and even going into the Scorpio, the last generation of the Scorpio that was that had sort of American influences to it. Well, it, that was perhaps the one where they allowed. It was Patrick Lecomont who was responsible, and uh, you know, for the hatchback. I won't say he was uh, fully involved in the sedan that came later, but uh, yeah, um, yeah. I was thinking about the nineteen nineties one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 It, it, it had, I think, more European influence than than the previous Fords had. Not to say that the Mark II Granada wasn't a, a very handsome car, I think. I joined Ford in 1979 in Dunton, and I was shown into the showroom. It was the day before they launched the Mark II Granada, and I was stunned by that slim, so sharp car, which um, had carryover doors from the Mark I console. Very clever. Which yeah. nobody knew, nobody yeah. realised. Yeah. It's amazing how they do that. So going back to Ford and Volvo, we're going on tangents here. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, I'm yeah. It's okay. It's fascinating stuff. Um, yeah. So 
I, I asked whether Ford were happy with, with Volvo, but you know, were Volvo happy under Ford's management? Did was it was it a harmonious thing? Did it work well? Uh, well, uh, Volvo is a very proud company, and the Swedes are very proud of their homegrown businesses. And uh, I think there was there was some frictions about the direction we were taking, but. Uh, um, Ford were the owners, and uh, you know they. Um, I think they respected Volvo. I think when um, when um, they put the the Brit in charge, he had that nice balance. Then then we had a, a bit more of a, a balance between Detroit and Gothenburg. Um, okay, very good. Also, okay. I can't, you know, as I said, it's quite a long time ago and uh, yeah. um, memories do fade, but it, it was um, a very interesting time, but I, I think I could sum it up, the difference between the Ford years at Volvo and the Geely years at Volvo. I, I would say that in a nutshell, Ford came to tell us what to do and Geely came to ask us what to do. And that's a big difference. And I think that's where the current success stems from. Allowing, yeah. as Chairman Li Shufu, Li Shufu said, um, let the tiger free in the, in the forest. Set I, the tiger free. When I, when I was looking at the SAT uh, script that I was writing, I must admit, I did spend probably too much time looking at the the, the corporate side of it, because that's the bit that interests me. And it's fascinating to see how Geely has, Geely's put $10 billion into the company. I mean, Geely spent a lot of money on the company, but. Right, now I'm going to stop you here. It's Geely. Sorry. <laughs> I've Geely. heard this so many times on your YouTube videos. And I've always wanted to write to you and say, it's not cheap. <laughs> I'm sorry. There are so many people that complain about so many things that I say because I only read them, and I, I don't hear people saying them. And then, yeah, it's like people say, bat, I say Bathurst, and people say, you can't, it's Bathurst. Do you say that? Anyway, yes, Geely, I'm very, very sorry. Anyway, Geely's put $10 billion into the company. They, they've spent big. But likewise, Volvo hasn't had bigger sales. That, that you know, This is the highest sales that they've ever had previously. I think 2019, they sold over 700,000 cars. That's more than they've ever done. So yeah, I mean, it, it's a it's a formula that's working for Volvo, yeah. and they're doing such a great job. Absolutely, yeah, lovely. Well, I think uh, when I look at um, what what I did was take a very square, boxy look, and and that pendulum was so far that way. Let's say that to the boxing, I perhaps took it as far as I could the other way, and and today they are perhaps somewhere where they feel comfortable and should be. And I admire what they've done for the last um, five, 10 years that uh, I, you know, I left and moved to Geely Global Design. Um, but Volvo certainly uh, created a, a complete different uh, impression of themselves with, uh, in those times. And Geely have allowed it. Geely has you know, set the tiger free, as they said. Okay, yeah. So, other than me saying the word Geely wrong, um, <laughs> are there, are there, are there, sorry. And by the way, if if there is anything else, please feel to feel free to drop me a line. I'm, I'm more than willing to hear about it. Um, <laughs> but uh, are there any other interesting parts of the S80 project which I've missed um, in my questions? Well, the, the ECC it had those shoulders. And I, 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 I used that, um, uh, I, I told people that it was the, the 544 front fenders where in those days, all, all other cars in the 40s had rounded mud guards, let's say. The PV had flat top, then a radius, then pure vertical sides to the front fenders. And I always, felt that that was very much in line with the Swedish furniture. You know, 
where, where English furniture and American was all voluptuous, big armchairs with rounded forms, rounded backs. The Swedes used bent wood, and that's the way bent wood turns out. And that flat top radius vertical was the inspiration from a Swedish chair that you can still buy in uh, Ikea, not Ikea. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's that look which created this very unique shoulder on the ECC and therefore the S80. And to be honest, if you look back at the Volvo 140 and 240, it's there as well, all the way down the side, a flat surface coming away from the bottom of the windows and then a radius and then the vertical. So that was another part of that design, which uh, to me, um, was, I, I was able to sell it as Scandinavian design because it, it, it was seen in furniture. On the interior, the, the, the top of the uh, center console had a, an arc over it, which we took from Swedish architecture. The, over the top of a window in Sweden, you don't get a Norman arch or a Gothic arch or uh, anything else or flat top. You get a slow curve, which is quite unique. And that's what we put in there. So as much as we could, um, myself and my interior design manager, Jose Diaz de la Vega, um, we, we used to spend Saturdays going around Gothenburg, looking at buildings, looking at shops, looking at furniture to get inspiration. Because uh, as I said at the time, it often takes a foreign pair of eyes to spot the uniqueness in a, um, in a society or, you know, the, um, the, the design of things, the, um, the culture, uh, the visual culture of a country. The, the locals grew up with it, so they don't see it as being anything unique. But then we came in and spotted things which I felt we could use uh, to, to still, even if we were tearing up the Volvo design book, we were maintaining that Swedishness that... Um, I think gave us something exotic uh, selling in the world. When when I worked at Microsoft and I had people come in new to the team, I always said to them, you are in a unique position because you don't have all these preconceived ideas that we now have. We're all have these railroad tracks of, you know, we're always going down the same path because we're not, we, it's hard to jump out of those and see something different. You have this unique perspective to see something different and I want to hear what it is. Yeah. 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 That was precisely that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, thank you, Peter. Thank you for your time. This was an absolutely wonderful experience to hear from the horse's mouth all the all the information about what happened with the S80, which people just don't know. So, um, yes, thank you for your time. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. And um, I'll keep watching uh, Big Car. <laughs>